The incidence of AML rises sharply with increasing age and it's becoming increasingly clear that this large population of patients who have previously been very poorly served both by stem cell transplantation and effective drug therapies have some exciting new treatment options opening up. And so the ambition in older patients with AML is to deliver maximally effective therapy as defined by eradication of disease and one hopes long-term disease-free survival uh, at the same time as minimizing toxicity. The considerations as to what treatment modality you utilize obviously differ very much according precisely to how old old is uh, and also to patient comorbidity and also I think importantly patient wishes. One of the most important advances in the last 30 years in the treatment of older patients with acute myeloid leukemia, I, I will broadly mean patients over 60 here for the sake of argument, is the demonstration that it's possible to safely de deliver a transplant now using what we call reduced intensity conditioning regimens in patients up to the age of 70 or 75. And that's really important because allergenic transplantation delivers maximal anti-leukemic effect both through dose intensification but more importantly through delivery of a potent graft versus tumor effect that has a capacity to eradicate the disease. So the development of reduced intensity and less toxic regimens coupled with the marked increase in the availability of suitable donors for patients, and that's because of the expansion of adult unrelated donor panels, and also the increasing availability of good quality cord blood units, means that uh, an allergenic transplant should now be considered as a key part of the treatment algorithm in all newly diagnosed older patients with ML who are fit. It may be that for various reasons one doesn't pursue the transplant option, but it should certainly be considered right at the uh, start of treatment. So there should be tissue typing of patient and urgent unrelated search, so that if patients are deemed subsequently to be eligible for transplant, one can proceed swiftly to allograft. And then of course there's the really important question about which patients uh, in this older group should we take to transplant. We're understanding more now about the groups of patients who can tolerate transplant. And it's now a determination really not on chronological age but on biological age. And there's increasing use of comorbidity indices, typically the hematopoietic transplant comorbidity index, the HCTCI, that allows us to identify a sizable population of patients with zero or, or modest numbers of comorbidities who actually tolerate transplant about as well as younger people. Whereas it's clear that if you have multiple comorbidities, transplant is really very difficult to deliver safely and shouldn't be considered as an important treatment option. And so the uh, determination of patient comorbidity index at diagnosis is now a really important part of deciding which treatment path they should pursue. Within the area of transplantation, which is such a, a potentially effective uh, treatment approach, there's now active work to identify how we can deliver transplants both more safely and more effectively. Disease relapse is the major cause of treatment failure after transplant. The UK is leading on a randomized trial of conditioning regimens in older patients having transplant, and that's important. And we're also leading on a number of studies where we're using drugs post-transplant to try and reduce the risk of relapse. But as we've identified, there's a substantial body of patients for whom a transplant is not indicated. And for those patients, I think the demonstration that hypomethylating agents, which are uh, uh, chemotherapy in one form, but they don't have the toxicity associated with intensive chemotherapy and can be delivered mostly as an outpatient, are again a very significant advance. And there's important randomized data showing survival benefit using a drug called azacitidine in older patients deemed not to be eligible for intensive chemotherapy. So the active research questions now are how do we increase the activity 
and durability of responses to azacitidine, and the UK is leading on a number of studies combining azacitidine with histone deacetylase inhibitors. Now, a separate, very promising area for the next five or ten years, I think, is the development of targeted therapies. It was reasonable to uh, surmise ten years ago that acute myeloid leukemia was going to be molecularly too complex to develop targeted therapies. And in fact, many of us had considerable skepticism about this approach. But we are now seeing a, a segregation of acute myeloid leukemia into smaller and smaller groups with particular genetic profiles. And it's turning out that a number of agents that target dysregulated pathways in those small subsegments can be particularly effective. So I expect to see hypermethylating agents and epigenetic therapies become consolidated as core therapy, but at the same time, through molecular stratification, identifying uh, increasing numbers of patients who benefit from targeted therapies.